Lita, Lita, you're setting a terrible example. We, we need to be using Mark. Okay, pardon me. Uh, where'd, where'd Ed go? There he is. Okay, I'll go up there with you. So Ed Young, who's a science writer, obviously very well-known blogger too, but science writer for Nature and National Geographic, kindly, kindly offered to moderate our open floor uh, sessions. So the goal here is to uh, really get the group talking, basically based on Owen's charge, of what are the current gaps, needs, and challenges for this field, considering how diverse the population is. So I think Ed wants to maybe kickstart the sure. conversation, yep. and I'm going to just sort of wander down here. Yep. Okay. okay. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Um, oh, it's part, I'm sorry, one more thing. Chris and Nick are going to be taking notes from this open floor, so we'll have a record of all the open floor discussions. Thanks. Okay, hi, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and to finally get to put so many faces to um, citations. Um, I've written about a lot of your work before, and it's a fascinating field of science. Um, please do ask questions. Um, we are relying on you to be piercing and insightful to your colleagues. Um, if you do not do that, then I, the journalist, will be forced to ask ridiculous and dumbass questions in place. So uh, it is in your interest to speak up. Um, our four panelists here are meant to be uh, lightning rods for that discussion, and a lot of our other panelists you've heard from today uh, are in the front, um, and they will answer questions as well. But we want this to be a very open discussion, so feel free to um, answer each other's questions, and you know, let's let's make it a, a, a very um, uh, open, free-form uh, chat. However, um, unlike what I just did, please make sure and use the mics. Um, there are mics peppered throughout the room. I'm also willing to share mine, and I think there's a couple of others floating around. So, uh, if you want to uh, ask a question or, or, or comment, please make sure and line up to the mic. Thanks. Um, and also, uh, this is the first of three sessions, so we obviously have a lot of time to cover a, a lot of the areas that we're uh, talking about in the next few days, like translational aspects. Um, so let's uh, talk about big picture stuff, tools, resources, all the issues that you've heard about today already. So I'm going to open with um, a question that uh, one of your microbiologist colleagues who isn't here uh, sent me via email. Um, you couldn't make it. I'm sure he's cackling with glee. Um, I mean, it's this. Many group, different groups um, have recently said that they uh, know and understand the key to uh, various complex human phenotypes and the, ra the rise of various human ailments. Uh, some think it's epigenetics, others have uh, touted copy number variation, and now we're seeing that uh, a lot of people are saying it's the microbiome. So the question is this, is that hype or is there truly something special here? Would any of the panelists like to? I mean, to, to me, it, it, it's not complete hype. Uh, I think that, you know, anybody who claims they have the key and there's only one, I think that's nonsense. I think the microbiome is, is a component of a complex system uh, that involves, I think we've seen it here today, not just the microbes, the host, the immune system, of the host and so on. And I think that without understanding the microbiome component of that complex system, we're not gonna get the big picture of, of all those phenotypes. Okay, so that, that's my view, to it, my view to it. And does anyone else have any views on that? Microphone's <laughs> disappeared. <laughs> 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 going on, can I ask something? So, at least in America on TV, we see more and more advertisements for probiotics that'll make you feel better. So is that part of the hype here, or do any of the speakers feel that, yes, you can manipulate through some organisms the health and well-being of patients uh, with regard to specific diseases. So, so one thing I thought was that we could um, leave the probiotic discussions for the third day, which is focused on the translational aspects of the work um, today. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write that down, and we'll lead off with that um, for the third of these uh, discussions. But Martin, do you want to go? Uh, uh, yeah. So um, I want to respond to this question about whether it's hype or not. The, the short answer is nobody knows yet. but we have a lot of diseases that have increased dramatically in a relatively short period of time of, of human existence. In 50 years, certain diseases have gone up 100 percent, 200 percent, 500 percent. Enormous changes. Changes in, in the human genome can't account for that. On the other hand, we have lots of data 
that is emerging that the microbiome is quite plastic uh, and is subject, as David mentioned, to lots of different kinds of perturbations. And so it's at least a testable series of hypotheses that perturbation in the microbiome is of sufficient magnitude to account for many of these changes in disease incidence. Great. Thank you. So do we have any questions from the audience? So we hear lots and lots and lots about DNA sequencing, right? And there's hardly any other techniques out there. Is there any room for any other techniques, given the power of DNA sequencing and data analysis, or is, it, is the future just going to be DNA sequencing, both in the clinic, analysis, studies, and so on? Is that one for me? <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> I'll take it. So I, I think that uh, DNA sequencing is is foundational, and so that that we need as a as a platform for many of the other techniques. But I think that other techniques are highly complementary. They they're not as well developed, perhaps, as the DNA sequencing. But I we're starting to see a trend, for example, with proteomics in development of the technologies that are I mean considerably lagging behind being able to produce as much information as the DNA sequencing, but there is the upwards trajectory there. So, so I predict that in maybe 10 years' time or so, we will, we will have sufficient data from other types of, of data sets like proteomics to complement the sequencing. But right now, we're very sequencing-centric. And uh, I'd just like to add to that that a lot of the tools that are, uh, a lot of the analysis tools that are originally developed for DNA sequence analysis, including, um, in, including ones that Greg and uh, Curtis and I have, uh, have, have put together, those are equally applicable to other kinds of data sets. So all the stuff that I showed you, for example, there's absolutely no reason we can't do that with, say, uh, metatranscriptomics or metaproteomics, except you're not going to get thousands of samples anytime soon, which is the volume of data that you need to use those, those kinds of visualizations. But uh, all, all, of that, uh, all of that type of data, including both taxonomic and functional data, can slot right into a lot of the, a lot of the analysis methods that you're familiar with from DNA studies. So if I could just comment, I, I like Sarkis Masmanian's line, I think it was, that he was doing experiment omics and that, uh, you know, the, the whole idea of uh, doing hypothesis-driven experiments based on genomic data and then following up on aspects of the hypothesis with biochemistry, structural biology, whatever, and get to new studies you might then do with omics methods and then back again to develop a richer picture. And I think already we're seeing um, some of the, um, many of the high impact papers with uh, microbiome type data also have an array of other kinds of stuff, immunology, uh, whatever, that fleshes it out and uh, turns it from being descriptive to mechanistic. And I think that's a pretty strong theme in the last couple of years. Thanks. Hi, uh, yeah. Um, so I, one of my questions, when I looked at uh, Rob's discussion about the American gut, and I think that's an absolutely wonderful project. It's, you know, the project where you're starting to really get an idea of, the, of really human biodiversity. It's an opportunity to look at human biodiversity of the human gut. But then it makes me think about what we often affectionately refer to as the normal cohort. And this normal cohort is 80 percent white and affluent, largely students from universities in urban areas. And I wonder, is that okay? I mean, maybe it is. Maybe, maybe the design is, is fine and it's going to really help us move forward. But do we need to start representing a more diversity of people even within our own country? And if we're going to do that, how are we going to get it done? Because these smaller pockets of money are, are side projects like the American Gut, which are, again, absolutely wonderful. Is that really enough to get the job done? And so I guess that's, that's my question is, is if our, one of our charges was to evaluate the core human microbiome, which, which implies a human biological diversity project, that implies a biodiversity project, did we really even touch that? So thank you. Um, so, so it would be absolutely spectacular uh, if NIH were to fund a uh, human microbiome diversity project on the scale of the human genome diversity project that was done as part of the, um, as, as part of the human, uh, human genome project. Uh, we just don't have, uh, so we just don't have a good stratified sample that covers diversity. That would be a far, far more efficient way to do it than self-participation. But at the same time, it has been very difficult to get a project like that funded, at least to date. 
uh, and it's not, an, it's not entirely clear to me why reviewers hate it so much. Uh, maybe a bunch of them are in the audience and would like to comment on that. <laughs> but, uh, but, but, getting, but getting that kind of, uh, you know, getting that kind of project going would really expand what we know about the human microbiome, what we know about how it can vary, uh, and what the major factors are underlying that variation. And, uh, and so, so, crowd, so crowdsourced and crowdfunded projects are going to go some way towards that. Uh, but it's going to be a long time before that type of project can get the infrastructure that you would need to do the sampling properly if you were going to use it for epidemiology, for example. So actually, along the same theme, um, I, I really wanted to applaud, uh, Rob, your paper about uh, studying the, the meta of studies. And personally, I'm beginning to get a little bit of an anxiety disorder about um, facility effects in animal studies. Uh, we're seeing a lot of good animal studies, um, but as we saw, you know, different mouse providers, different bacterial backgrounds, and, and I wonder, uh, I, I think we may need a, um, a real Manhattan Project in a sense to address some of our key large animal models, some of our key small animal models. Um, across multiple vendors, multiple strains, multiple facilities, um, and do that sort of ahead of time rather than post facto, because it might be a little bit hard to disentangle after the fact. Yeah, again, if I could just comment on that briefly. So, the, um, so, so pharma has a huge amount of data, but unfortunately you can't have it. Um, in, in, in addition to the facility effect, there are also huge cage effects, and so doing things like uh, looking at genotype effects in the context of, uh, of litter mates, replicating them across multiple cages, and additionally replicating them across multiple facilities can be really critical. Um, in the interest of time, I dropped a bunch of data that we have on that specifically. So, um, so, so in that case, I'm not sure we need. So, so that that is one of the cases where uh, where where I think we can do that by a distributed project rather than a centralized project, though, because uh, there's enough cases where the same mutation has been re-derived multiple times, or where you have uh, where you have mice that have been shipped between facilities and so forth. That as long as people are able to very accurately record. Uh, what they did, where they got the mice from, uh, what the mutation was, and so forth, how they've been fed, uh, in, in the way that uh, Owen was describing very nicely in his talk. That's, that's exactly the kind of distributed project where it would be a little bit of administrative burden for everyone, rather than a giant centralized uh, $100 million project to even get off the ground. Uh, but I think collecting that data would be absolutely, uh, would be, uh, absolutely invaluable for making a lot of progress on figuring out what you can reproduce. If I could make a comment on that, um, we recently completed a study where we studied fungi as well as bacteria, and we saw wave after wave of fungal colonization in a cage-specific way, even in our controls. So I think it's probably even worse with fungi than it is with bacteria. But one thing you can do, at least with bacteria, just an element of the design, is use a lot of cages for your controls, use a lot of cages for your experimental, and then permute by cage and try to uh, treat that as a variable from the start in your design, and then ask if you have a signal over the cage effect. If I can, add, if I can speak here, just, sure. yeah. just to add a little bit to that, I mean, I think certainly for those studying the immune system, I think for the last 30 or 40 years, there's been enormous variability in the kinds of results that have been reported uh, for various autoimmune diseases. And I think now it's appreciated much of it has to do uh, with the source of the colony. Now, it's becoming obvious that it goes way beyond the immune system. And of course, we've heard some other things. Recently, uh, people in the autism field have found that they cannot reproduce behavioral defects that they have with uh, particular mutations. Uh, in, uh, in autism genes, and uh, it hasn't yet been shown that that's related to microbiota. It could be related to feeding, to other conditions, but uh, I think many of us would not be surprised if that's what it's, going to, what it's going to be. So I think we do need some kind of an appreciation of what constitutes a, a, a basic microbiota, certainly for, for rodent studies. Uh, you can definitely see with something like SFB, maybe SFB is an outlier, but it affects a lot of uh, different disease processes uh, in mouse models. And I do think that we need to have some, uh, some kind of better monitoring uh, 
uh, uh, so we can do comparisons across the board. Okay, there's a question there on the standing mic. I think she's first. Okay, sure. So I just want to go back to Owen's charge a second about potential gaps in knowledge and move a little bit away from computational gaps and more into the concept of study design gaps. And so I'm interested in people's feedback um, uh, to um, the, the issue of how do we actually power up metagenomic studies. You know, from the WashU group, we have some derelict multinomials as to how we actually can adequately power metagenomic studies, but I don't think that we adequately have described, depending upon which type of metagenomic analysis we're going to do, when have we actually adequately powered a study to detect the differences that we do. And the second kind of gap in terms of study design that I think is important to think about is we've all published in various forms about all kinds of different stratification that we see, either whether we're talking about the HMP reference data set, which I will comment back, was actually very well representative of the U.S. population at large. We were just shy of 30 percent of non-Caucasians, and we had good race and ethnicity looking across the, the U.S. as a whole. It was very representative, actually. But, but when we're starting to think about these stratified analysis, when we're looking into all of our different data sets, we know that males and females have very different profiles across multiple body sites, and we don't always go ahead and stratify our analysis into male and female or stratify our analysis by race or ethnicity. And the third kind of gap that I potentially see in terms of our study design gaps is um, really thinking about um, when we're doing different types of stratified analysis and how we're going to look at our data, whether or not if we give any given moment in time what we call healthier reference is always going to be amenable to change, especially if we're working in younger reproductive age populations, simply because disease manifestations haven't taken fold. And so it's important to remember that a fixed phenotype in a moment in time will not always be true necessarily as that time goes on. And the importance of actually looking at that in a broader kind of longitudinal dbGaP data set that becomes a little bit problematic because it means that investigators actually have to update their phenotypic data. But there have been some of us that are associated with CTSA and other clinical trial networks in which we actually do update our phenotypic data over time so people know how those disease sites change. So I'm curious in other people's feedback and thoughts in thinking about study design um, and whether or not these are good knowledge gaps for us to be approaching and thinking about moving forward. Does anyone have any response to that? It sounds good to me. <laughs> the, <laughs> those are, I agree that those are gaps. Okay. Yeah. Uh, R.A. Fisher wrote a lot about good study design in the 1920s, and it's still true and, uh, you know, worth reading that literature. But, but, I think, uh, but, but I think especially as the sample sizes start to increase, um, yeah, people who have done large cohort studies, uh, especially ep epidemiologists who've had to deal with large multivariate data collections before, really have a lot to offer in figuring out how to uh, how to standardize large studies, uh, how, to, how to figure out batch effects and either reduce them or detrend for them. And uh, as Rick said, uh, having, having multifactorial study designs where you can explicitly take things like uh, cage or um, sampling plate or that kind of thing into account are really useful. So for example, if you're running all of your time point zero on one plate with one sequencing technology and then waiting two years and sequencing your um, experimental cases with like a different technology, you'll probably find some differences, but you probably don't want to uh, attribute them to the phenotype rather than the technology unless you've done the appropriate control. Charles. Although well, you'd be surprised by how often that happens. And I think building on that, I mean, a multifactorial study design is incredibly difficult in clinical research to power to. It's, it's very difficult, but in this type it's even worse. And most of, our, most of our power analysis that we're trying to do is based upon very high biomass samples. And as we move into regions of low biomass samples, it becomes even more convoluted because you're getting much fewer microbial reads per sample to try to actually power to. So I think those are huge gaps in our knowledge in trying to design good studies is then even thinking about is it a high or low biomass sample. Um, yeah, with, with respect to power, I think one of the key challenges has been that 
uh, until very recently there just haven't been enough studies to even guess what the effect size was going to be for a new study, which I think has led to a lot of people having the following very frustrating discussion with either their IRBs or their reviewers about, uh, you know, if we knew what the effect size was, we wouldn't have to do the experiment to find out what the effect size is, and that's why we don't have a power analysis. But, uh, you know, at this point, um, at, at this point, there's enough uh, data sets out there with varying numbers of, of subjects, very, varying treatments and so forth, where if you can guess which study might have an effect size that's similar to the study that you're trying to do, uh, what you can do is you can take the data from that study and uh, do permutation tests or subsampling or that kind of thing and, um, and, and uh, ask how few sequences or how few subjects in that other study could I have got away with to still see the main effect claimed in the paper. And so so, so, so we have a tool called Evident, primarily developed by Antonio Gonzalez, that, uh, that, that addresses that problem. That we're, uh, we're, we're preparing that for publication at the moment, but like all our other tools, you can, uh, you can get it off GitHub uh, in advance of publication and uh, try it out. But basically what, what it lets you do is it lets you feed it an, an existing study and then ask if I had had just a subset of the data from that study, what fraction of the time would I have seen the result that's, that's claimed in the paper? And so that kind of thing can be really useful if you have some uh, analog of the experiment that you're trying to do. So suppose you guess that your effect size is going to be as big as the effect of obesity or as big as the effect of the difference between a, a one-year-old and a five-year-old or as big as the difference between, say, the hand and the gut. Uh, if you can guess some analogous physical situation, you can, uh, you can, get, you can get a long way uh, powering the study that way. Uh, but then you have to pay very careful attention to what your outcome measures are, right. right? Because there are so many different analyses that you could do. But if your plan is to basically get your data set and do all of them, well, you'll always find something significant. Okay, let's take a couple of questions at once. So um, our intrepid questions can sit down over there and then followed by that. Okay, so uh, I'm Linda Duffy from NIH. And my question is, it's uh, an intriguing concept regarding uh, keystone species. And <clears throat> perhaps one of the values of the large-scale genetic screening is if we can really identify key genes in both the eukaryotic intestinal epithelial cells and in the prokaryotic microbial communities. And so I kind of would just like to pose a question to the panel as to what model systems do you think could enable us to understand how a specific bacterial gene could be responsible for a specific metabolite and how a specific host gene recognizes this metabolite. Okay, great. And uh, let's take one more question and then we'll get answers. Oh, I just, I just had a comment about what Rob was saying earlier about uh, doing population-based studies on the gut. Um, you could, um, I just wanted to suggest perhaps that, um, accessing the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey. Uh, maybe the CDC can work together and because that's a population-based representative sample, um, diverse sample based on race and whatnot. And I also just want to add one other comment about um, your talk on causation and, ca and and association of differences. One of the hurdles I face as an epidemiologist is that um, it's sort of a structural hurdle with applying for funding is that um, clinical trials include sort of behavioral interventions as well and there's extra hurdles for accessing those funding sources if you're doing an intervention which would be the best evidence for causation. So just a just a additional comment. Thank you. Um, okay so to this question about um, key genes and model systems for linking genes, specific genes to metabolites. I can try to tackle that one. <laughs> um, so I, if I was trying to link a specific organism or gene to a metabolite, there, there's several things, several ways I would, I would want to go about that. First of all, if you have a metagenome uh, that is sequenced to the sufficient depth that you can try to bin out that organism's genome, that would be great because then you could analyze the genome itself and try to understand some of the functional genes on that in the genome. But Often you can't do that, and so what you're normally left with is the correlation between a species abundance or gene abundance and the abundance of a metabolite. If, if you do know what the organism is, you could always introduce it into a, a mouse model, a notobiotic mouse model, and then look for some kind of cause, causation there. 
if you don't know, if you don't have the organism isolated, of course, then it's much more difficult. So those are the two ideas I had. But um, I think if you, if you think in the context of longitudinal sampling, then you can start teasing out association of abundance of the metabolite and you know, correlation with abundance of the, because you can have a metabolite made by several of different bacteria, the same one. So um, it's another way to approach the problem. Just while we're waiting for that, the longitudinal studies give you dramatically more power to uh, figure out uh, to figure out causative associations because you can use things like distance encoding and uh, look for changes rather than absolute state, which which is a lot better. It's been really effective in looking at uh, associations between different taxonomic levels in the ocean, for example. Yeah, and also you c if you have longitudinal data sets, uh, you can uh, fit uh, mechanistic models that explicitly model um, the uh, links, the, the biological processes that lead to the patterns in the changes in the substances and abundances that you're following. So it's much more effective. Thank you. I think some of what you're asking is, uh, again, could be old-fashioned experiment omics, uh, gene hunting, um, looking for enzymes that act on particular substrates, uh, stuff like that, the sort of old-fashioned sort of analysis that I think has a lot of potential to augment the metagenomic kind of studies and help interpret them and understand them. Yeah, I, I was really specifically addressing um, the niche specialization concept. And if you really do uh, look for keystone species in different niches with very specific metabolite, you know, how do you set up the model systems? And just getting your input into, you know, there's various ways to consider that. but. Thank you, that was great. So you, you raised something I was going to bring up eventually was there's a dirty little secret and that's that about 30% of the genes we're talking about we can't annotate. We don't know what they do um, and so we don't know what metabolites they might produce. And so that's a problem. The other problem that we have is that, and Janet mentioned this, that it's very nice how you go from the amplicon sequencing to the metagenome to the metatranscriptome and yes the proteome is wonderful because it actually looks at the activity that's present but that's even that's not quite correct because it's not the flux so nobody's looking at the enzyme kinetics right so you could have an enzyme that's present at low abundance but it could be very very active and account for a lot of the flow of nutrients through the system and so when you look at the pathways and genes that people are talking about they are the pathways where we know what they do glycolysis, central metabolite, amino acid metabolism, uh, purine metabolism, and so on. When you look at the constancy of the functionality that's present in these things that we've seen on the gut, the genes that are being reported, the pathways that are being reported, are those of central metabolism, which you would expect to be common and invariant among living organisms because you would expect to be DNA polymerase should be there somewhere, and purine biosynthesis should be there. And that would be true for all the bacteria that are present. So a gap would be to figure out what to do with the 30% of the genes we don't know what the heck they are, and to try to get, and I don't know how to do this at all, some idea of how that affects energy and nutrient flux through the system by an estimation of kinetics, right? Because if we're going to be talking about ecosystem dynamics, then it's going to be carbon and energy flow through that system that's going to be driving it unless it violates ecology at lots of different levels. So there's still a, a huge gap, right? We're making progress and getting smarter, there's a question about the omics, right? We have a bigger toolbox than just sequencing, as Janet pointed out, but we still have more tools we need, and it has to do with actually looking at things that tell us something about the flow of energy and carbon through systems, and maybe getting to the signaling processes, which I would argue are not going to be the major pathways. You're going to find those in the genes. You don't know what the names of them are and what they do. The ecology is in the part we don't know yet. There's an assertion you can. <laughs> Let's just have one quick response to that, and then we're going to go to um, more questions. Did you? Yeah. Did you want to? Uh, Larry brought something uh, very important, and is that uh, from macroecology, there's another very important concept, which is, uh, for a long time, people looked at these keystone species because they were visible, because they had people funding research for these highly visible animals. But then, suddenly, um, 
a lot of theoreticians realized that the indirect interactions, the weak interactions, were also very determinant in these webs. And so these uh, weak interactions from microsystems ecology um, can be very important, and we might miss them just because they are not very visible. Okay. Um, qu a gentleman in the back there had a question. Uh, thanks. I, actually, I wanted to comment on <coughs> a previous question or um, a comment about the uh, gaps that we have. Uh, being someone who works in the front end, that is uh, thinking about clinical design and uh, how to sample patients, a lot of the low technology types of things, I think it's really critically important that we have a discussion and, and some uh, consensus about how we do those things in the front end because they can profoundly affect the interpretation of results that come out in the back end. Uh, let me give you an example. So uh, my area of interest is in the study of inflammatory bowel diseases. Well, this is, these are typically thought of as two types of diseases. Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. But I think that with the information that we've gotten from GWAS studies, it's clear that there are many ways to the same end. That is, the description of these two clinical phenotypes represents the end of many potential pathways that eventually lead to it. So in, if you consider that, these, these IBD may actually be not two diseases, but actually a dozen or even a hundred diseases. And if you consider that, then the issue is how do you stratify people so you're not comparing apples to oranges? And that becomes very difficult when you're trying to run your data analysis, let's say, on the microbiome. The other consideration is that inflammatory bowel diseases has different stages. And what you see in the early stage represents a completely different set of potential pathogens or causative agents and pathophysiology than what happens in later stages. And these are considerations I think we have to bring into the equation in order to correctly interpret the data that we get from the microbiome. Thank you. Um, can we get comments from over there? Yeah, I just wanted to um, return to the previous um, discussion about, about how to identify keystone species or keystone elements in a community. Um, and this may have already been highlighted previously, but aside from the idea of using synthetic communities and deliberate knockouts of the sort of the methods that Andy Goodman and others have used previously, and aside from the use of, I think, very valuable insights from, um, from epidemiologists of decades ago um, in looking at cancer and environmental uh, factor associations and positive causation uh, links, that um, one of the really great needs right now would be a, sweat, a, a suite of, of reagents that would allow for um, a deliberate knockdown of specific features of a complex system in situ. And so small molecules, for example, that might inhibit a specific enzyme um, or uh, knock down a specific uh, transcript or an organism. And I think there are lots of great leads on how each of those things might be devised and, and standardized and ramped up for higher throughput production. But one example being this paper from a couple years ago, and I'm going to forget on the authors, and they're probably here, but the, the deliberate design of, a, of an inhibitor for the glucuronidase that, um, that acts upon CPT11, this anti-cancer anti agent. Uh, rendering the conversion of, um, of an otherwise relatively inactive form to an active form um, diminished and thereby allowing greater use of this drug um, in cancer settings uh, simply by targeting microbial or microbiome enzymes. So just a few comments. So it's the microbial version of shooting all the wolves that Rob talked about. Right, right, the, the, the targeted uh, shooting, right. Uh, Curtis? I, just, I wanted to comment quickly on, on something that Larry said earlier, um, since a, a question we get a lot about the functional stability is whether it's, it's just the boring stuff, I and mean, whether it really is um, central carbon metabolism and, and the ribosome and DNA replication and whatnot. Um, and that is a big component of it, but it's by no means all of it. 
Um, I was checking for examples on my phone in line here. Um, chaperones, type two, type six secretion, host interactions, stress response, are all among the microbial pathways that show that same metagenomic selective effect. Um, so two things that I, I perhaps didn't emphasize enough to go along with that are one, they are differentially regulated transcriptionally. Um, and two, that's one of the potential parallels with our own genome. Just because most of it's the same doesn't mean that the, the smaller parts that are different are uninteresting. And I think that, that's where it gets back to um, that edge of functions that we have not characterized yet. 30% um, is, is perhaps an underestimate, if anything, and those small differences between us are going to be what, man I agree, are going to be what manifest in phenotypes the same way that, that small differences in our, our own genomes do. So two comments, if anyone has a response, please uh, chime in. I, I could just mention that also at the metabolite level, I mean, speaking of unknown things, you know, it's, it's vastly much more than 30% of the metabolites that we don't know. So, so definitely a lot of things. And, and I also wanted to reply to the, the question about the IBD um, studies and, uh, and the fluctuation of disease phenotypes. That, so, so when we look at the, you know, we, we just did this one longitudinal study of, of different IBD patients over time, and the, fle the thing that's really interesting and that I didn't present is to get the clinical data uh, as much as possible because these patients are taking drugs, they're taking an antibiotics, they're, they have flare-ups, they, um, some of them have, have gone through resection surgery, and that is, that is the really meaty, interesting data. To, to match on to these wild fluctuations that we see. So, so that's, the, that's the goal. And uh, Kurt, as following up on your response to Larry's comment, uh, I mean, I know you did a lot of controls uh, for the HMP paper, and then we also uh, did a bunch of controls for the Tim Bauer 2009 uh, and uh, Nature paper, Mergay et al. 2011 science paper. Uh, precisely to make sure that what, uh, that we weren't just seeing uh, effects from every every microbe has to replicate DNA, um, uh, make amino acids, and so forth. So so those so those those controls have certainly been done, and uh, that's not all that's going on. Now at the same time, though, uh, as uh, as as Curtis and Owen and I all mentioned in in our talks, if only briefly. Uh, there's a huge amount of information that's out there in people's heads about the functions of specific genes and gene families that's not currently in the databases in a form that we can use to automatically annotate all of the data that all of you are producing. And it would be uh, fantastic if we, if we could figure out a crowdsourced effort to basically get all of those annotations into a standardized format so that we can provide precisely that kind of service back to the community and get the amount of un unannotated stuff down from 30% or uh, whatever it is currently uh, down to less than 1% and really see uh, at a much more sensitive level a lot of those differences in rarer pathways and rarer functions that we know for sure are important in some cases and are probably important in a lot more cases than we know. And, and Curtis, you know, just correct me if I'm, I was wrong, but in, in the HMP paper, uh, the functional stability uh, that you, you observe was actually least stable in, in the vagina, if I remember well. There was a subgroup of, of subject that where the function is changing, at least the potential function. Yep. Yes, definitely. That was also the case. Uh, it's also important to recognize that although the function is, the functional profiles are a lot more stable than the taxonomic profiles, but the variation that there is in the functional profiles is highly correlated with, uh, with the variation we see in the taxonomic profiles, even though the variation is a lot lower, right? So they're a lot more stable, but the instability is highly correlated with the instability in the, in the taxonomic profile, again, suggesting that it's not just that the assay is very insensitive and you see the same thing no matter where you look. And, and to turn around and restate that, the, uh, uh, as someone who sits in a biostats department, it's also more statistically significant because it is more significant, or excuse me, more consistent, even though the magnitude of that change is smaller. Okay, um, another question from the middle. So, you know, we've talked a lot about metabolomic analyses and analyzing metabolites, but I think it's a good thing to keep in mind that it, it's a really a snapshot of what's going on because what we're measuring is metabolites that aren't being utilized by the community at that given moment in time. 
So I guess I, a challenge to the field in my mind is more real-time sampling and also sampling within an animal or human model over time to get a more accurate picture of how these metabolites are being utilized or not being utilized by a specific community. So that's a challenge in my mind. I agree. <laughs> that would be great. Excellent. Okay, and another question from over there. I have a, a very general question about the use of uh, macroecology to uh, address the uh, relationships in our bodies. Um, in particular, there was the discussion of wolves. What are the wolves in our bodies? And are these macroecological uh, um, analogies actually appropriate? Is, is the wolf the immune system or the phage or perhaps uh, the communities in our bodies are just structured in a rather different way from macroecological systems and these analogies break down rather sooner than we'd like to think. Um, well, I'll answer the second question first, which is a lot of those analogies don't even hold between different macro ecosystems mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. a yes. lot of the things that uh, often get thrown out as uncontroversial in these kinds of meetings applied to microbial ecosystems are also controversial in macroecology, mm -hmm. so it is worth being a little bit careful <laughs> about that. Um, as far uh, you know, the uh, as, as far as what the keystone species are in uh, in human associated body habitats, uh, to a large extent, we don't really know because uh, the the ability, uh, as as has been mentioned several times, to completely remove a particular microbe from uh, a human associated ecosystem without causing much larger scale disruptions like you do with antibiotics. And uh, as Pete Turnbaugh showed in his really elegant cell paper earlier this year, that response to antibiotics also seems to be individual specific. So you can't guarantee that the same antibiotic is killing the same bug when you, uh, when you administer it to different patients or even to the same patient at different times. Uh, it's really difficult to do some of the specific kinds of species removal that have been possible in macro ecosystems or that have been accidentally done in macro ecosystems. Uh, the other thing that's been really interesting there is the invasive species literature where you have accidental introductions of species into an ecosystem that hasn't seen it before. But, uh, you know, because they're on about our, our, our own scale and you can go in there and see the interactions and uh, count them and, uh, you know, sit there with your binoculars and see how often um, the lion's taking down the gazelle or whatever, it's a lot harder to do that kind of thing in the gut and uh, basically no techniques exist for doing that in situ yet. So that's really a major challenge, right? How can we, how can we observe ecological interactions directly in the gut as opposed to uh, ex situ after you do something like, say, pull out the fibres from, uh, for, you know, you can dissect out the fibres from faeces and see what are associated with them, but by the time you get them uh, separated from the substrate, uh, you're, uh, you know, that takes a long time and you've disrupted a lot of the interaction that you're, that you're looking for. Um, one, one, one principle that's very transferable from macroecology is um, issues, about, uh, issues about bias and census, uh, censuses. So uh, a lot of people spend a lot of time worrying about um, isn't our sampling biased in that, uh, you know, um, DNA extraction is going to be biased, PCR is going to be biased, uh, amplification of, uh, of, of whole genomes is going to be biased and so forth. So, so, so that's something that ecologists have, have dealt with for a long time. So if you put out traps for insects, for example, uh, exactly how you baited the trap, um, how you set up the, how you set up the cover, uh, you know, how, how far it's sticking out of the ground or inset into the ground, um, where you put it in relation to vegetation and so on. All those are going to bias what you see, but, as, but if the methodology is consistent, the differences that you see across sites are still interesting and relevant. And so um, I think we can definitely take a lesson from that aspect of uh, macroecological studies that, uh, that, that a lot of the time uh, what you care about is differences with consistent methodology rather than necessarily needing an absolute count or an absolute census to get at very useful data. If I could follow up on uh, what Rob said in, in one regard, uh, with all the NIH people here, I, I worry we may be leaving you with the impression that thing, things like all the methods, all the analytical tools, wet side, dry side, are a lot better figured out than they are, uh, talking about the biases and stuff. I mean, we, we all put our best foot forward when we give talks. We don't like talking about the, 
dirty linen and stuff like that, but there are huge biases in how we sample, uh, how we deal with reagent contamination, um, how we do the analysis, different ways of aligning metagenomic data, different tools can lead to very different pictures. And, you know, ideally you'll do it a few different ways and make sure you get the same answer or for the most important thing you find, you test it some other way, but boy, the there's a lot that's still in flux and getting developed and I, I hope the NIH people are sort of responsive to that. I think a grant that has a piece where they're testing out how the methods work I think is better than a grant that doesn't and so, you know, I, I don't want to leave you with a fat, the idea that this is all finished and everything works perfectly and that's that. Although if I could add to that, that it's really important that the methods development piece has, uh, has enough to it that you can actually find something out that's generalizable. So uh, one, one thing that's a huge problem with methods papers that are submitted, for example, to the ESME journal still on a regular basis is uh, that there's basically an analysis of one sample where that one sample has been run through a bunch of different methods and amazingly the results are statistically di uh, significantly different depending on which method you used. And the reason why that's not useful is there tends to be a lot of, uh, there, there tends to be a lot of difference between different samples um, in terms of their interactions with the different methods that you try out. So if you do a lot of tech development on one sample, uh, very frequently it doesn't generalize uh, even to other samples you collected from the same body site. And so one, one thing that's really critical, if there's going to be a methods development piece, you need to run it on enough samples that you can draw useful conclusions that are going to generalize to other studies rather than, uh, r rather than finding out uh, a lot about one sample in a way that's not going to generalize. Um, I think we're, we're going to take one more question because we're, but that clock's going to turn red in a second. So let, let's, um, the gentleman in the middle. So, so on, on the theme of gaps and challenges, I guess something that I would uh, raise to the community as a whole is that a big gap we have are the samples themselves. Um, and namely being that uh, we don't have, or, or the, the access to, or the, the ability to um, analyze large cohorts uh, that are well characterized, have good phenotypic characterizations that you can map phenotypes tightly um, to be able to understand differences in genomic data is a big challenge. And, and the reason I say that's a big challenge, even though there are various cohorts out there, um, uh, they're not as big as they need to be. Um, and in addition, uh, getting funding for cohorts and such things is extremely difficult um, given the commitment of both uh, private and uh, public funding sources. And so I guess uh, something I'd put out there as a, as a large challenge is as a community thinking about how we can actually create uh, these large cohorts. Um, and things like the American Gut are obviously a great attempt to do that. Um, one concern I have in those types of systems goes back to I think what Owen was talking about earlier is in the end also it's the sample characterization itself. And so unless we have really strong standards uh, around how we characterize those samples as well, um, it's an additional challenge. It would be better to have well characterized, characterized populations or would it be better to just to have access to more people? What are you rate limited by? Is it, it could you just expand? Unfortunately, both, I think. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, as, as a community, if we could uh, have access to, say, still samples from everyone in, in Haines, which was brought up earlier, everyone in the National Children's Study, uh, everyone in the Framingham Study, and so forth, that would be an incredible resource. Uh, at the same time, I think it's been fair to say that it's been challenging to try to get that kind of thing together, at least to date. Well, I mean, it, it, it's possible. Um, I know for a fact that, for example, in England, they have a study similar to the National Children's Study, and they are collecting stool, both on the moms and the babies, mothers only. So I, I don't think it's, you know, we should give up. I think there's still possibilities. Yeah, I didn't really want to bring that up, but it is true that especially Scandinavia is doing an amazing job on this with stool samples from, uh, you know, stool samples collected at birth from kids who are now eight years old, um, thousands of them in the freezer and that kind of thing. And so we're, we're doing a lot in that direction at the moment, which yeah. is very exciting, as are a number of other people at the meeting, like Ruth, for example. And the life study is 90,000 pairs, mother, children. It's incredible. Yeah. Okay, and on that optimistic note, um, let's call this discussion to a close. Um, we'll see you all tomorrow, and please enjoy the bar. Thank you to our panelists and to all the people who asked questions. Yes,